Chapter 29 covers trauma to the head, neck, and spine. First we'll talk about nervous and skeletal systems. First we'll talk about the nervous system. It controls the thought, sensations, and motor functions of your whole body. Biggest part of that is the central nervous system. Part of the, the parts that comprise the central nervous system being the brain and the spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system is vertebral nerves, the cranial nerves, and the motor and sensory nerves. So those nerves that you put your hand on something hot, sends a signal back to your brain, says it's hot, sends a signal back, says lift your arm, dummy. So as you can see in the picture of the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, those peripheral nerves, everything that causes sensations throughout the rest of the body. So the brain and spinal cord are the main feed sources for this, and all these other ones are extension cords off of the main electrical line. So with the anatomy of the head, the spinal cord exits through the base of it through an orifice called the foramen magnum. So the brain connected to, is in the skull, spinal cord is up through the foramen magnum connecting to the brain. Cerebral spinal fluid basically coats the brain and the spinal cord, kind of acts as a uh, water protectant. So it's like the brain and spinal cord laying on a water bed, makes it comfortable, keeps it uh, able to bend and move and kind of float without rubbing up against bone. So multiple parts of that head, you see the parietal of the sides, the frontal bone in the front, temporal bone, temporal region near the ear, occipital bone in the back. And as you see in the image here, you can see the form of magnum here to the spinal cord to run down through, as you can see here in this MRI image, the back part of the brain in the occipital region and the spinal cord coming down through that skull in the form of magnum and then going inside those vertebrae. So with the spine, you've got the skull, and then you have all your different sections of vertebrae. Atlas and axis are your C1 and your C2, those very top vertebrae. So atlas and axis, alphabetical order of C1 and C2. Those are the big ones. Any damage to those, generally death. Uh, so of those cervical spine, along with C1 and C2, the atlas and axis, there is seven cervical vertebrae. In the thoracic, there are 12. In the lumbar, 5. And then the sacrum is a solid bone as well as the coccyx of the tailbone. So cervical, you eat breakfast at 7. Thoracic, lunch at 12. And lumbar at 5. So that's 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and 5 lumbar vertebrae. Now we'll move on to talking about injuries to the skull and brain. So scalp injuries are very deceiving in how bad they are. The scalp has a lot of blood vessels, so it can be profuse bleeding. So if anybody's ever busted their head or seen someone with a busted head, generally a whole bunch of blood coming from a very small wound. So actual injuries to the head generally are superficial, just uh, to the venous bed, just cutting a small cut, but if there's a whole bunch of vessels in the head, it'll cut through a bunch of vessels. So a lot of just cuts and nicks to the head look much worse than what they are. Actual injuries to the skull are classified as open or closed head injuries. So of course, open head injuries, you can see the skull, sometimes the brain, closed, everything's still intact. So here's a nice picture of an open skull fracture. So you see it going down through the flesh, a crack in the skull, seeing down deep in, seeing their inner thoughts. Another indicator of skull injuries are what is known as a battle sign. As you'll see the reddening and the bruising behind the ears and raccoon eyes. So generally raccoon eyes is an indicator of a skull fracture and the battle size is an indicator of a basilar skull fracture. So that back of that skull is broken. There's various types of skull injuries. 
there can be the linear non-displaced, basically just a blow to the side of the head caused the crack. There can be a uh, depressed, which is an indentation of that. So say somebody gets hit really hard with a baseball and puts a dent in their skull. There's open, like in the picture before, or an impaled object. Basically all these are simple BLS management things of just controlling bleeding and getting them to a trauma center. And if it's impaled, stabilize it. As with skull injuries, there is open and closed. With brain injuries, there's direct and indirect injuries. So a direct injury is the brain itself is actually damaged. It's been bruised or punctured or there's a cut to the brain. Indirect injuries, basically the impact of the skull transfers force to the brain. So basically the brain will smack off the actual skull surface, such as an instance with concussions and brain contusions. A traumatic brain injury is an injury that disrupts normal functioning of the brain. So that can be a uh, concussion to where it may be actually so mild the patient's unaware that they are not acting normal or they're not in their normal state of function. And to where it can be a contusion. Uh, contusion comes from those coup or contra coup injuries. As you see here in the picture of the coup is that frontal blow kind of like in a whiplash instance where coop the brain slams forward into the skull and contra coop is the brains going backwards so you can imagine in a whiplash accident there could be a coop and contra coop injury so with those traumatic brain injuries there can also be uh, those lacerations, actual cut to the brain from those direct injuries, as well as hematomas, um, basically a brain bleed is what a hematoma actually is. So there's subdural, epidural, and intracerebral brain bleeds. So a picture of each type. So a subdural, you see the bleeding is below the dura. So sub being below, like a submarine goes below subdural bleed so below that dura matter which is the outer layer covering of the brain an epidural epi meaning around or about is outside the dura matter so epi out about around the dura matter and the intracerebral is those actual brain lacerations deep within it direct brain damage so patient care for a traumatic brain injury always Take BSI precautions and maintain C-spine. Make sure you open and maintain that airway. If the head injury, uh, generally there's going to be a cervical injury, can be good with it, so modified jaw thrust. Make sure you're always keeping an eye on changes in breathing for the patient. It doesn't mean that just look to see if they're breathing or they're not breathing. Be looking for changes in their breathing patterns. Maybe it's fast, maybe it's slowing down, maybe it's kind of all over the place. Control any kind of bleeding you see and keep the patient at rest, trying to keep them calm. Keep them conscious and talk to them, providing emotional support. Cover up all wounds, all wounds, all wounds need covered. Anything that's penetrated or impaled, stabilize that. Treat the patient for so shock, get them warm, keep them cool, or keep them warm, don't let them cool down. Throw a bunch of blankets on them, keep them warm. Uh, keep an eye out for any kind of vomiting to protect that airway and aggressively monitor those vital signs every five minutes. So now we'll talk about ICP, intracranial pressure, not the old crazy clowns. So with ICP, that's when that hematoma, that brain bleed gets so bad it increases that pressure in the skull. So the skull is a solid surface, so whenever stuff starts coming in there, that skull cannot expand. So the pressure inside is building up and building up from all the blood and everything starting to build up in there. So it can get to the point where the ICP builds, pushes on the brain, and ends up developing into neurological abnormalities. 
sometimes depending on or depending on how bad the bleed is exact where it's at if it's an epidural subdural however it is depends on how time or how long it may take for those abnormalities to occur sometimes it can be instantaneous sometimes it could be weeks or days for those issues to arise so symptoms with increased intracranial pressure is rising blood pressure and a slowing heart rate together those are known as Cushing reflex also with that there is a term called a Cushing's triad triad meaning three to where that would be the Cushing's reflex but with a change in breathing patterns so a triad with a three of increased blood pressure lowered heart rate and crazy breathing patterns generally with that there's always going to be the altered mental status they'll be out uh, out of their mind um, also have dilated pupils maybe both maybe only one or slow reactions to those pupils from hypoxia and the pressure on those cranial nerves so what's talking about with the crazy breathing is called Shane Stokes breathing so basically that's where the breathing starts a little bit slow gets faster 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 and then may just kind of stop so it'll sound like So the pressure hernia on that brain will create will drastically change those breathing patterns. Um, there's also just central neurogenic hyperventilation, just a neurological thing that will make them hyperventilate. And then ataxic respirations, just meaning that they breathe, but it doesn't really have any kind of rhythm to it. So it may not necessarily be fast or slow, just not regular. So. just there's no pattern no rhyme or reason to how they're breathing it's just like the patient can't make up their mind how they want to breathe also that there can be posturing so there could be decorticate posturing basically all the limbs turn towards the core where the arms and the legs flex and extend so decorticate comes to the core decerebrate is where the arms are extending and the legs have extended so the turning outward posturing decerebrate is at last stage so if a person uh, is decerebrate posturing that's worse than decorticate the next movement they'll make after that will be flaccid and death so now we'll talk about some injuries to the face and jaw with that the biggest concern you have is the airway from blood teeth other kind of debris getting in there causing an issue if possible allow for drainage of bleeding and stuff to occur when dealing with trauma patients you always want to use the Glasgow coma scale your GCS scale uh, this will be your main consensus of their neurological stuff and their mental status so along with GCS the AVPU to determine what their level of responsiveness is so considerations for the GCS of how to use it um, first is um, eye opening whether they do it on their own or that kind of goes into the um, AVPU method so when you're determining that level of response to AVPU you'll get the eye opening if they're alert you know they have their alert status with eye opening if their eyes open to verbal painful etc so it's the Verbal responses, you're going to get oriented, confused, uh, inappropriate words, incomprehensible sounds. So, the first part of GCS being eye opening, the next part is those verbal responses of how the patient responds. So, you know, oriented being they know exactly what's going on, confused, you know, just as it says, you know, inappropriate words, that doesn't mean that they're cussing at you, calling you a dirty scoundrel or anything like that. That just means that. If you ask them, hey, what time is it? Or do you know where you're at right now? And they say, squirrel. That's inappropriate words. If they give you a response that's not exactly what you're talking about, those are inappropriate words. Then the incomprehens incomprehensible sounds are those words that you just can't really even understand what they're saying. Or it could just be a bunch of babbling that you don't even know what it is. 
with the, and then there could just ultimately be no verbal response. With the motor response, you either have the obey command, you tell them to raise their arm, they do what Simon says. Uh, with localized pain, if they don't obey the command, when you go to put a blood pressure cuff on or something, they may reach for it. That would be localizing pain. Or if you give them a sternal rub, they'll reach for your arm. If they are with, withdrawing from painful stimuli, that's if you give them a sternal rub and they move away. So that kind of is with a posturing. So that would be your um, get into decorticate and decerebit posturing. So you see in this GCS chart of eye opening, four being spontaneous, a score of three would be the voice, two pain, one is none, unresponsive. So that is where you're getting from your av poo. A verbal response is that five, normal conversation, they're oriented. Four, disoriented, confused. Three is words, not coherent or those inappropriate words. Uh, two, no words, only sounds, incomprehensible terms. One being none. With motor response, six is normal. That's Simon says. Five is where they localize pain. Four, they'll start to withdraw from the pain. So if you do stern rubs on them, they'll squirm away instead of localizing it. And then three and two are the posturing. So decorticate coming to the center, decerebrate going away. One is none. So you want, hopefully your patients are a four, five, and six for GCS of 15. If not, you can, rephrase, you can phrase it as, say, a GCS of a three, four, four, or whatever correlates into that. Don't just always give the GCS summative because different numbers can add up to the same score and mean different things. So your four, five, six is that normal patient. The one, one, one is a complete unresponsive, flaccid, or dead patient. Now remember, whenever you give these GCS scores, what no, knowing what is normal. So for those dementia patients and stuff, they may constantly be a four, four, six. They may be able to talk to you, but they just are disoriented to place and time, but everything else checks out okay, and that's just normal. So for wounds to the neck, in the neck, a whole bunch of large arteries and veins that are uh, very superficial and could be potential for some very life-threatening bleeding if affected. With those large vessels in the neck being of lower pressure than the outside, very susceptible to sucking air emboli into them, causing a pulmonary embolism. So basic treatment for that is stop the bleeding and prevent an embolism. So put an occlusive dressing on her, keep it covered up, control that bleeding. Always make sure they got an open airway, gloved hand over the wound, using those occlusive dressings and using pressure to stop that bleeding. Keep the, pr the bandage and the dressing in place, don't remove it, and immobilize C-spine if it is affected. So now on to injuries to the spine. Always assume cervical spine injury based upon the MOI, mechanism of injury. So some illustrations here of some mechanisms of spine injury. Diving injuries, bashing your head off the bottom of the pool, bending that neck. People die like that every year impacting into the windshield or other objects in a vehicle in a motor vehicle accident or those reaction and impacts from say rear end type collisions those whiplash injuries of coupe and contra coupe. So identifying potential spine and spinal cord injuries. Always assess that mechanism of injury so a quick scene assessment to get on there possibly what happened and doing that good general impression of the physical condition of the patient. So some high risk mechanisms, falls from greater than three feet or down more than five stairs. Yes, it doesn't seem like three feet is a whole lot, but depending on how they fell, it could be very dangerous. Uh, also axial loading, those compression injuries such as the 
uh, diving and spine injuries. So think about the opposite motion of a crinkle straw. Take a crinkle straw, you pull it out, crackles and pops. The opposite way, pushing it back together, crinkles and pops. That's an axial load injury. Also, high-speed motor vehicle crashes, especially with rollover or ejection of the patient. So using those detective skills to see what happened, trying to determine any kind of energy or force that's made movement on the spine beyond its normal range of motion, such as things like whiplash. Uh, also, some underlying medical issues could cause those injuries to be much worse. More high-risk things, ATV crashes, bicycle collisions. Uh, always maintain a high degree of suspicion if it was a vehicle accident. Uh, there's numerous other things that go into it, but just be trying to put on your detective hat and see, possibly be thinking outside the box, could this have caused neck injuries? And then always really good assessments on that patient. So if you're assessing on them and you're feeling across all this process of the spine and you find pain or tenderness, those are hugely important findings. Every patient you find who has pain in the neck on the spine needs to be on a backboard and completely immobilized. Also any paralysis of the extremities of course is a very pertinent finding or any changes in their neurological function or overall pain and tenderness anywhere along through there or any kind of impaired breathing. Also if you find a prior prism meaning a lower lumbar injury could affect the nerves of that external genitalia causing a priaprism. If they've defecated, if they've had loss of their bowel or bladder control, or any kind of deformities, a neurogenic shock, meaning basically they're in shock, but um, you don't have the crazy heart rate coming up, blood pressure dropping, just the blood pressure has dropped. So what happens with that neurogenic shock is there's a damage to the spinal cord and the signal coming from the brain to those vessels you know tells the vessels they don't have to know what size to do so they just open wide open so below the site of the injury so say if you break your lower back the cords cut all the vessels below that open wide open so all the blood it should be evenly distributed goes down to those lower extremities where those vessels are really wide so those lower extremities below the site of injury will be red and flushed and above it will look shocky, that pale cool diaphoretic. Also in assessing them, in the secondary assessments you can assess the dermatones of the patient. So basically the body surfaces that are covered by a single spinal nerve they will be able to use to identify any kind of loss or function or the extent of neurological damage. So with this patient, you'll see in the illustrations here of the different collars of the cervical areas, that the nerves that affect there, and the th thoracic, and the lumbar regions of how they affect, and the sacral nerves. And see you, where those will correlate over to the side of those cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral nerves of where they affect on the body. So you can see in the upper torso, those nerve pathways run side to side whereas in the lower extremities they kind of run vertically. So when you assess that patient in secondary assessment you'll kind of starting at the feet you'll go to the head. So you'll start at the feet and just swipe sideways across different places. Light touches or slight pain to see if they can feel any of that. Then when you get up just around below the pelvic or right at the groin region below the belly button you'll start to go upwards. So that way you're crossing across the nerve pathways. So then you'll go here and kind of go up the sides of the body, see if they feel any sensations or anything like that. And then also, you see on the back side the sacral nerves, you know, generally they're going to be on the backboard when you're doing this. But just a good note, when you take patients to a trauma center, so to test the sacral nerves where that's around the buttocks, one thing that ER doctors will do to assess the uh, dermatones of the trauma patient they will stick something up their butthole to check the sphincter response to make sure there's no neurological uh, damage to there. So they'll feel all the way back down through this, checking all these, and then to check the sacral nerves, they will stick something up their bum. 
So for patient care, always maintain inline stabilization of the C-spine. Assessing those ABCs, head to toe assessment, apply C-collar after you've done the head to toe assessment, and then checking your CMS, your sensory and motor functions. So spinal mobilization, it's kind of changed a little bit over the years. It used to be to where even low risk patients were treated like they had a spinal injury, to where if you're in a car accident, you're getting put on a backboard. That's just how it is. There was no gray area, it's just black and white. You get hurt, you're on a board, no matter how bad it is. Because uh, it was taught that the most important thing was restricting the movement of the patient in case they did have any spinal injuries. Um, with that, a lot of second injuries or secondary injuries are caused by hypoxia, shock, hypoglycemia. So why it's really good to do those good thorough assessments to try to limit those secondary injuries or what's end up being proven to be sometimes the most fatal. So one of the first steps is limiting that spinal motion. So maintaining that C-spine. So you put your hands around their ears, stabilize around the neck and the head, preventing and restricting that movement. Always put on an appropriately sized cervical collar and use that in conjunction with any kind of other mobilization device. Remember, no collar by itself will eliminate movement of the neck. Just because the C collar goes on doesn't mean you stop manually holding C spine. Collar goes on, it's just an aid for holding C spine. So if the C collar is on, they're going on the board, they gotta get head blocks and taped. The caught by itself will provide good uh, restriction of movement, but still the most definitive thing for trauma patients is being put on a long backboard. Uh, there's some other ones coming into place like vacuum mattresses um, and mobile and bendable boards where they'll kind of contour to your spine. They're basically like a bean bag that you suck all the air out of and they'll fit to your shape. But still, in most systems, it's still the backboard, especially those patients having pain and tenderness in their spine areas or just when um, you're going by your gut that they are injured. So put on that C collar, one person's mainly holding C spine, the other person is sizing the collar and putting it on in place. And once it's on in place, the person still maintains manual stabilization. So some issues you may have with spinal mobilization is the patient may have been found in an awkward position to where their head may not be neutrally in line to where you can put on a C collar and you may just have to keep it in place. So just be cognitive of cervical collar sizing and when and where to put it on. For pediatrics, they do make pediatric C collars, but if you don't have one available, best thing to do is use some rolled towels and pad in all the voids and keep that neck in line. So we've talked about how to backboard a person who's already on the ground to do the log roll on the board. Now we'll talk about doing the same things to somebody in a seated position, such as a patient in a car. So with low priorities, patients who don't need out of the car right now, but they're kind of hurt, but everything else is pretty stable. You use a short board or a vest type of mobilization device, such as a KED. So you put that on, so then you're not bending and prying on their spine, getting them out of the car. Just keeps, starts that mobilization early, and then you put them on a board. For high priority patients, if you got to get them out of the car, say there's an airway issue, uh, bleeding issue, something crazy, or a mental status change, they need to get out to the hospital quick. High priority is just holding C-spine, an urgent move, holding C-spine, onto the board, out of the car, and ambulance to the hospital. So here is a KED. As you see, it's pretty EMS friendly, so it comes with collar coated straps, so you know where to buckle it. Um, you see in the picture below here, it wraps around the torso, and then the back part goes up around the head to keep everything in line. So this will be used in conjunction with the C collar, wraps around the head, straps go around the torso, and then there's also straps that go around the legs. Now this is only for mobilizing, this is not used to lift patients. Other types you can use is a short spine board. Those are few and far between anymore. So if you're gonna mobilize them onto some kind of a short board or using a KED, you'll start 
um, tighten them at the torso. Generally, like on the KD where there's three straps, you'll start at the middle, go to the bottom, and then go to the top. So remember, you need to assess all the areas before you cover them up. So the KD will cover up the back, the shoulder blades, the arms, collarbones. So check all that before you put on the KED. A little bit, it does take a little bit of task as the person that's holding C-spine, the second partner, partner will have to take the KED and put it between the two arms of the person holding C-spine. You don't want to let go just to put the KD down in there. So it would be a little bit of an awkward position at first, but it will easily go on. Avoid applying that first torso strap too tight. So the best sequence to use is that middle bottom top. Because if you get that top strap too tight, it makes tightening up the bottom ones that much harder. Also, don't pad between the collar and the board. Just put the board in there and put it as it needs to be. Sometimes when padding with KD, you have to use a little bit of padding between the head and the board. Just don't use too much to where their head is basically leaning forward. And depending on what the device is, there's multiple ones, KEDs, XP1s, a various amount of vest type devices. Just follow their instructions by the manufacturer. Just be sure whatever device your agency has, you're well trained on it. So you see in the picture here the two EMTs placing the KD. So first that KD would have had to fit between the two arms of the provider holding C-spine. Then the KD goes back in behind the patient down to flat on the seat and then the straps would wrap around the patient and secure them. For putting them on the long backboard, standard method of log rolling the patient and padding any kind of voids um, that you see. Especially some of these older patients that kind of have a bend in their spine, you may have to do a lot of padding so they're not on there like a turtle on its back. Um, when strapping, always secure the head last. Even if you get uh, the other straps on there, securing that head last to the tape blocks everything is the last thing to be done. If the patient's pregnant, after you get them secured, slightly tilt that board to the left so that, that fetus isn't laying on that inferior vena cava, reducing blood flow back up. So tilt that prego chick onto her left side slightly. And then straps across the upper chest, pelvis, and the thighs, just avoiding strapping over a site of injury. Whenever you're strapping little ones, always we're probably going to have to put some padding under the shoulder blades of generally at least a kid under the age of six to keep her head in an anatomical position. Immobilizing a kid in their car seat used to be taught but it's not recommended anymore just because of the fear that the car seat they're in could have been damaged in the accident they were involved in. So you can still take them out and backboard them. There are pediatric spinal boards to where you don't have to use the big long backboard. They may have their own little kitty backboarding system. Now to mobilize a staying patient, say you showed up to a car accident and they're out walking around and they're complaining of neck and back pain. Well, you don't want to make a move anymore so you will use a standing takedown. So this require at least three providers, a seat collar, and a long backboard. So you'll get the patient's seat collar after you've assessed the neck and the cervical spine and you'll put the board back behind them while they're standing up. So the person will be behind the board holding C-spine and the other persons are going to get everything positioned. So it's the tallest provider at the head of the board because this is going to be an awkward hold where the arms will have to wrap around the board drooping down and the board will have to pass between the torso and we're holding C-spine and then let the shorties be down here and putting an arm through the patient's armpit grabbing the board keeping that patient in line and then lowering the board to the ground and securing them. If your patient has on a helmet that motorcyclist has went down there are times when you can just leave the helmet in place to where it may be more damaging to the patient to take it off. So if the helmets fit snugly, that their head's not loose inside of it, uh, there's basically no airway or breathing compromises, 
um, that it's not going that it would further extend their injury by taking it off and you can still mobilize them with the helmet on the helmet can stay in place if those don't hold true you can take the helmet off so if it's interfering with the ability to assess and manage the patient or it's an improper fit take the helmet off